Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Please be seated. Thanks for coming to say hello. Uh, what I thought I'd do is share some thoughts with you and then answer questions for a while. Before I do, I, I, I want to thank uh, Randy of the Loudoun County Chamber of Commerce for setting this up. I appreciate you all coming. Um, I've got something to say, and I hope you do as well, uh, as we have a conversation about how to uh, make sure this economy of ours continues to stay robust and strong so people can find work and realize their dreams. Uh, before I talk about the economy, I do want to uh, say Laura sends her regrets. She came home last night at about 12.45. She just came back from Africa, where she and Daughter Barbara and Connie Weissman to witness the swearing in of the first elected woman president of the country of Africa. <laughs> they had a great trip. She said it was an inspiring inauguration. Just wish she'd have tiptoed in a little quiet. <laughs> She's been great. And, uh, you know, one of the best things about the presidency is uh, how close our family has remained and uh, how wonderful a wife and mother she is. American people get to see that. Speaking about families, uh, Chuck Hughes' family is pretty remarkable. Uh, turns out his mother works for him. <laughs> That's the opposite in my family. <laughs> On that. <laughs> Restructure the chain of command. <laughs> but I love being here in a place uh, where uh, a guy who had a dream at age 17 years old, that's how Chuck was when he, he started to act on uh, his entrepreneurial instincts, he said, If I work hard, if I'm smart and if I figure out what the market wants, I can build something that I call my own. And 23 years later, we're standing obviously in what has become a very successful business enterprise. Successful because uh, he is thriving and expanding. Successful because he has provided people a good place to make a living. And so I want to thank you, Chuck, for being a great entrepreneur. I want to thank the folks who work here for setting this uh, uh, deal up. I, uh, I'm here to talk about how to make sure that America is the place where the entrepreneur can succeed. That's what we're really here to discuss, isn't it? It's a wonderful place to have that discussion. Before we get there, I want to thank the Attorney General Bob McDonald of the State of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, for being here. Appreciate you. He's sitting next. He's an old governor buddy of mine, Bill Graves. He was the governor of Kansas uh, during the time I was the governor of Texas. And I used to remind him he made a really smart move when he married a woman from Texas. <laughs> Still married, aren't you? <laughs> Good move. It's the best deal that's ever happened to you. It's great to see you. Bill is the uh, president and CEO of the American Trucking Association. Uh, I want to thank all the other state and local officials who are here, but most importantly, I want to thank the small business owners who are here. Uh, I was uh, interested to find out that Loudoun County is the home of 10,000 small businesses. 80% of which have got 10 employees or less. Pretty strong, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, probably one of the reasons why you're growing so fast is that people realize this is a good place to take risk. And that's really the role of government when you think about it. I like to tell people the role of government is not to try to create wealth. It's not the role of government. We'll share the role of government to help the poor, help the elderly with, with medicine. But it's not to create overall wealth. The role of government is to create an environment 
in which people are willing to risk capital, to take risk. An environment in which people are willing to work to realize their dreams, just like here at this drugging company. That's the fundamental policy uh, principle on which I'm basing my decisions uh, as, uh, as Congress uh, to think about how to make sure the economic growth that is now uh, prevalent in America continues. We have got a robust economy, uh, but it wasn't necessarily going to be that way, that way. When you think about what we've been through, it kind of helps point to what good policy may be. We've been through a stock market correction. We've been through corporate scandals, which affected the confidence of people. We have been through a terrorist attack, which hurt our economy. Uh, we have been through uh, war. We've had significant natural disasters, all of which could have uh, sent us into a downward spiral had we not put good policy in place. We've overcome these uh, issues, and I believe one of the main reasons why is because we let people keep more of their own money. I ask Congress for tax relief. I believe strongly that if the entrepreneurs of America have more money in their pocket, they will use it to expand their businesses. I believe more strong, sorry, very strongly that if a consumer has more money in their pocket, they will demand extra goods and services. And when somebody demands an extra good and service in a market economy, somebody's going to produce it to meet that demand. And so I went to Congress and said, look, we got problems. Let's be aggressive about how we address it. Let's cut the taxes on everybody. I remember the debate said only some people should have tax cuts. So we lower rates for everybody. If you don't have tax relief, everybody who pays taxes ought to get relief. You ought not to try to play favorites. Who gets it and who doesn't get it. Uh, we, we, got, we mitigated the damage of the uh, marriage penalty. I always thought it was a little contradictory to have a tax code that discourages marriage. It seems like to me we ought to encourage marriage in this country, and, uh, and the tax code ought to encourage that. We lowered the tax on dividends and capital gains because we want to encourage investment. We put the death tax on the road to extinction. The death tax is a punitive tax for small businesses and farmers and ranchers. It's a tax you pay, you, know, you pay income tax, and make money, you pay tax to the government, that's fine, and then you die, and then your heirs get to pay it all over again. And that doesn't seem fair. It seems like to me that you want a tax system that encourages families to be able to, to uh, a, a family member to pass their assets on to whomever they choose without the government making it impossible to do so. So the debt tax was put on its way to extinction. I said put on its way to extinction. The problem is you know, the way the law was written is coming back in life in 2011. Which is going to make some interesting estate uh, issues, particularly in 2010. <laughs> <laughs> we increased the child credit. Or we wanted to help families who got children. One of the things that's really important uh, for Congress to recognize is that most new jobs in America are created by small businesses. And if you're interested in job growth, then you got to be thinking about where's the where's the engine for growth? And it's the small business owners. Seventy percent of new jobs in America are created by small business owners and entrepreneurs. Many small businesses pay tax at the income tax, uh, individual income tax level, sole proprietorships, subject rents. These structures in which people are able to grow their businesses, but they're advantageous to the owners of the business and can be paid individual income tax rates. And so when, when you hear me talking about we cut taxes on individuals, you also got to recognize we cut taxes on small businesses. And if you want there to be job creation to offset the drama, the trauma that our economy has been through, our country has been through, then it makes sense to say to the job creators, get a little more money for you in your pocket. We also uh, encouraged investment. You might remember we made it uh, tax advantageous to uh, 
increase investment in plant equipment if you're a small business owner. All, all the policies that, we, uh, that I'm describing to you were aimed at saying to the small business sector, we understand your importance. Here's how to help you grow. The other thing that you've got to understand in Washington is that you hear a lot of debate about the deficit, and it's an important debate, don't get me wrong. But in my judgment, the best way to solve the deficit is to grow the economy, not run up your taxes. There's a, there's a myth in Washington. They say, all we got to do is just raise the taxes a little bit, and we'll solve the deficit. Now, that's not how it works. They're going to run up your taxes, but they're going to find new ways to spend the money and not solve the deficit. That's how Washington works. The best way, it seems like, to me to solve the deficit is to keep pro-growth tax policies in place and do something on the spending side. And so I'm working with Congress, and I want to thank the Speaker and the Leader for supporting and passing lean budgets. I say lean because we've got one aspect of our budget that is not going to be lean, and that is any time we've got a kid in harm's way, he or she is going to have the best equipment, best training, best possible pay. That's what we owe the families of our military. But on non-security discretionary spending, we slowed it down every year I've been in office and actually the non-discretionary security, non-security discretionary spending is <laughs> lower in 06 than it was in 05. We've actually reduced non-security discretionary spending. The issue of the budget is mandatory spending. That's when they, that means you don't have discretion. Switch by one. The two biggest programs we face, of course, are, uh, for mandatory spending increases are Medicare and Social Security. And uh, we're going to have to do something about it. And a lot of folks in Washington don't want to do anything about it. It's too hard politically. I want to share some thoughts with you about my view of too hard politically. I think we're supposed to do the hard things politically. I think the job of a president and jobs of leaders in Congress from both political parties should confront problems now and not pass them on to future generations. And we got a problem with Social Security and Medicare, and I'll tell you why. We got a bunch of baby boomers like me getting ready to retire. Matter of fact, my, I'm 62 years old in the year 2008. It's a perfect fit. <laughs> greater benefits than uh, previous generation. Politicians very well said, both of me, I make sure your Social Security benefits go faster than the rate of inflation. And as a result of uh, a lot of us retiring and fewer people paying the system, the deal's going to grow. It's hard for me to travel our country and look at hardworking people paying payroll taxes to a system that I know is going to grow. It should be hard for Republicans and Democrats to have to show as well. And so uh, I, I just want to assure you that no matter how hard it may seem for some, I'm going to keep talking about it. That's the job of the president, is to remind people of the challenges. There's a long-term deficit issue as a result of a, of a system which is out of balance and out of kill. And we can do something about it now. We have that obligation. The uh, Senate has a chance, or the House now has a chance to pass a... a, a Budget bill or appropriation bill, with the reconciliation bill, that actually starts to cut mandatory spending by making reforms. If the deal passed out of the House, passed out of the Senate, and that has to go back to the House. And uh, it would be a good faith gesture for people from both political parties to say, we, we, we see we got a problem with mandatory spending. Why don't we start reforming the system for the sake of the future generations of Americans? Things are going well, by the way, in the economy. The, uh, we had 4.6 million new jobs since April of 2003. What I'm telling you is that the tax plan is working, and here's why I can say it to you without uh, having to throw some hot air your way. Since April of 2003, 4.6 million new jobs have been created. Not a government by entrepreneurs. We had the national unemployment rate of 4.9%, I think it's 2%, 2.7% here in Lincoln County. 
Think about that. The uh, economy grew at 4.1% for the third quarter. And that's in spite of high energy prices, high energy prices, and, and, and two storms. But to think of how robust our economy is, we went from 4.1% in the third quarter of this year in the face of storm and high energy prices. That affects your business, doesn't it? Those high energy prices. And yet you're growing. Was, we've got a, an economy which is robust. The uh, interesting statistic is, uh, is the uh, manufacturing activity has been up for 31 straight months. We hear a lot of talk about manufacturers, the trouble of manufacturers, and of course there was some trouble, but we had growth for 31 straight months. Productivity is up. That's a really important statistic for our country because productivity, as a worker becomes more productive, as the workforce is more productive, higher wages follow. That's just a fact of life. You realize that uh, from 1973 to 1995, productivity in America grew at 1.4%. At that rate, the standard of living doubles every 50 years. But today, our productivity is up average 3.4% over the past five years. And we're more productive as time goes on. Technology enables our workers to be more productive. Education enables our workers to be more productive. Smart business leaders are constantly trying to figure out how to make their companies more productive. The more productive a workforce is, the faster incomes go up. The, uh, so what I'm saying is things are going fine. We have more minorities ever before in our country owning their own home. Home ownership is on the rise. And the fundamental question facing is what do we do to keep it going? What do we do? Well, first thing is Congress needs to make the tax relief permanent. <laughs> you, you know, this relief is set to expire. The easy course is, of course, say, well, let's just let it expire. That's a tax increase if the tax relief expires. We hear people say, well, we're not going to make it permanent. What they're telling you is they're going to run up your taxes. That's what they're saying. Failure to make tax relief permanent is a tax raise on the working people and the small businesses in this country. If you're a small business owner, there's got to be certainty in the tax bill. Congress needs to put themselves in the shoes of people who are trying to plan. Good business owners, good small business owners don't think, you know, two months in advance. They think years in advance. They're making capital schedules. They're thinking about how to grow their company. They're constantly strategizing. Uncertainty in the tax code makes it hard for the small business sector to stay confident and to make investments. And when there's uncertainty, it makes it uh, harder for this economy to show steady growth. So we need to make this tax cut permanent so we don't take money out of your pocket. And we need to make the tax cuts permanent so there'd be certainty when it comes time for small businesses to plan. I understand there's a problem with health care, and I suspect there's any question and answer. We'll get questions on health care. One of the biggest problems our small businesses have is the increase in health care. The role of the government, in my judgment, is to take care of the poor, the Medicaid, and community health centers. The role of the government, in my judgment, is to take care of the elderly through a Medicare program which is, uh, uh, which is modern. And by the way, it provides choices for our seniors. But I also think the role of the government is to encourage a direct relationship between the consumer, the patient, and the provider, the doctor, without, 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 without a lot of go-betweens. I think that uh, I know that small businesses should be allowed uh, the same affordability of health care that uh, big businesses get by, by being able to pool across jurisdictional boundaries. Pool your risk. If you're a restaurant owner here in Loudoun County, a restaurant owner in Crawford, like a couple of restaurants here. <laughs> Not that will be. No, there's, there's a good one. Coffee shop. Uh, the, uh, I mean, coffee station, excuse me. The, uh, but they should be allowed to pool their risk across jurisdictional boundaries. In other words, the larger the the risk pool, the more employees you're able to get in a risk pool, the easier it is to manage your costs when it comes to health insurance. You can't do that now. The Congress should be allowed to encourage you to, to be able to pool risk. An interesting product available is called health savings accounts. I strongly urge every small business owner here to look at. 
It's an innovative product that enables uh, the small business owner and the employee to combine, work together to come up with a plan where the employee owns it. So it provides for a high deductible catastrophic plan coupled with tax-free contributions in the plan. Basically gives the consumer control over his or her medical decisions. The plan can grow tax-free, which is an encouragement for people to make wise decisions about how they treat their body. If you have a catastrophic event, the insurance kicks in and covers it. It's portable. If you change jobs, you can take it with you. It's, a good, it's an interesting idea. It certainly stands in stark contrast with a system in which the federal government gets to make the consumer's decisions or tells the providers what they can charge. It's the opposite of federal control. It is patient control. We need to do a lot of information technology. The healthcare industry is, uh, is uh, inefficient in that you still got people filing out forms with handwritten notes. And doctors can't write anyway, and it creates a lot of confusion, as you can imagine. We need to have uh, legal reform. I mean, you can't have a legal system, I mean, a, a medical system that's available and affordable when you got your doctors being sued. You realize we've got a crisis when it comes to OBGYNs in America. The good docs who, who have got the great compassionate job of taking care of young they're, they're getting run out of business because of frivolous and junk lawsuits. It makes no sense. When I first came to Washington, I said, uh, you know, this is a state issue. But the problem with all these junk lawsuits is that they cause doctors to practice defensive medicine. In other words, they, they prescribe more than they should because they're afraid of getting sued. And when you practice defensive medicine, it makes the cost of medicine go up. When you couple that with increasing premiums, it costs us a lot of money at the federal level. I'm talking billions of years as a result of junk lawsuits. And good small business owners have trouble affording health care. Part of the reason why is because of these junk lawsuits. And so I decided this is a national issue that requires a national response. We need medical liability reform in Washington, D.C. so that health care is available and affordable. Laura always says I get too long winded when I come to one of these deals, so I'm going to rein her in here. That's something to say. Uh, we got to do something about lawsuits in general, not just medical lawsuits. One of the things I hear a lot from small business owners is they're afraid to get sued. We, we, we've got a society which is litigious in nature, just suing right and left. That, makes it, that runs up the cost of uh, staying in business. Makes it harder for people to work. Of course, if you have a legitimate loss of a job, you can live every day in court. Everybody understands that. It's just these frivolous lawsuits. And we're trying to do some things about it in Washington. We've got class action lawsuits which won't pass. We're trying to get an asbestos law that reform passed. We've got bankruptcy passed. We've got uh, manufacturer's liability passed when it comes to firearms. And we're making some progress when it comes to lawsuit reform. I heard the Attorney General here that they urge the governor and the Commonwealth to pass good law for lawsuit reform as well. It's a really important issue for uh, the environment here of our economy. Now, energy, real quick. Uh, look, we, um, we're hooked on foreign source of oil. We need to do something about it. Pure and simple. I, 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 I've got a strong faith in technology being able to lead us away from a hydrocarbon society. It's going to take a while. The federal government has a role to invest in research and development. Envision a day when, uh, when we're using corn, corn husks, different kind of grasses to be able to convert it into energy. Down in Brazil, they've got enormous amounts of energy to get from sugar cane. Their automobiles or flex fuel automobiles are able to convert from gasoline to ethanol made by sugar cane on an easy basis. I mean, it's coming. And the role of the federal government is to encourage these new technologies to be able to make us less dependent on foreign sources of oil. We need to be, we don't have more nuclear power in the United States of America. It's clean, it's renewable, it's, uh, it's safer than it ever was in the past. We need to be thinking about how we can use solar batteries better. There's a lot of things we can be doing. I'm confident that with the right policies and the right incentives, technology will help us 
diversify away from a hydrocarbon world. But we got plenty of certain kinds of hydrocarbons. We can use coal. I'm also convinced with the right expenditure of money that we'll be able to have uh, zero emissions coal-fired plants that will make us less dependent. You realize we've got about 250 years of coal here in America? It seems like to me a wise investment is to figure out how to use that coal in a way that heats your homes, fuels your businesses, and at the same time protects the environment. So we have to think about how to incorporate new technologies to diversify away from foreign sources of energy, not only for economic security, but for national security purposes. I want to talk real quick about trade. I believe it's important to open up markets. Uh, I think it's a mistake for this country to go isolationist when it comes to economic policy. You realize we're 5% of the world's population, which means 95% of the rest of them could be customers so long as we've got a level playing field. My job is to make sure that if you're producing a product, that it has fair access to markets. We ought to treat people, that people ought to treat us just like we treat them. And, and, and I, I'm a strong believer that if the playing field is level, this country can compete with anybody, anytime, anywhere. And if we can't, we ought to figure out why not. Competition is good, so long as it's fair competition. And finally, I want to talk about education. The, uh, as you expand your businesses, as they become, you know, as they change because of technology, you're going to need a workforce that is capable of filling the jobs. We've got to make sure we get education right in the United States. Otherwise, the jobs of the 21st century are going to go somewhere else. This is a competitive world in which we live. There's no way to deny that there's competition in the world. We play like it. We put up you know, foolish short-term economic policies that hurt the small business sector, protectionist policy. But it's a competitive world. And people are going to go to where the skill sets of the labor market are such that they can be able to produce the products of the 21st century. It's reality. So what do you do about it? Well, first thing you do about it is you make sure your kids at the elementary school get an education. Teach them how to read, write, and add, and subtract. The No Child Left Behind Act is a great piece of legislation. I think if small business owners you understand where I'm coming from, it said you got to measure to determine whether or not you're, you're succeeding. I was concerned when I was the governor of Texas that we had an education system that didn't measure, and therefore we didn't know. And oftentimes when you don't know whether a child can read, and write, add, and subtract, it just ends up being shuffled to the system. I believe that we ought to measure. As a matter of fact, we are now measuring as a result of the No Child Left Behind Act. We want, we want to determine whether or not you can read at grade level by the third grade, and whether or not you're at grade level the fourth grade, or fifth grade, and so on. And if not, here's some money to help you make sure the child is up at grade level. You cannot solve a problem until you diagnose a problem. And the No Child Left Behind Act is a diagnostic tool for local school districts. We're not telling you how to run your schools, that's up to you. We didn't design a federal test, we said we designed an accountability system. And it's working. We have an achievement gap in America that is not right and needs to be closed. We have too many uh, African American kids not reading at grade level when they should be, and I prescribe, like I say, a lot of that is due to just moving kids through without determining early whether or not they've got the skills necessary to read, write, and subtract. We're changing that. The achievement gap is closing. It's a really positive development. I tell you how I know it's a measure. And we solve problems early before it's too late. We got to have the same high standards in high school with an emphasis on math and science. We got to use our community college system to constantly upgrade the skills of people. If, as you know, the job market changes. The easiest thing for society is to have technological change. The hardest thing is to make sure that, 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 the, uh, that the education systems are flexible enough to help the, the job market change with technology. Community college is a great asset in our country. They're available, they're affordable, and if they're run right, they have a curriculum that changes with the times. They're not one of these institutions that just stay stuck. They're institutions that are going to change our curriculum to be able to educate people for the jobs which actually exist. That's what we need to do, I'm telling you. So I'm going to go to Congress here pretty soon and come along. Put economic policy, energy policy, health policy in place that understands that this economy is strong, but we need to do the right things to keep it going. With the center piece of our economic policy being the small business in America. 
Yes, sir. Mr. President, welcome to Loudoun County. Thank you. Uh, we've got a transportation problem here. And You've got a transportation problem here. And across northern Virginia. Yeah. Uh, downtime and traffic is loss of productive time for businesses, and it's time away from home and family for individuals. We don't get to use helicopters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I won't in three years either. <laughs> How can the federal government help states and localities address transportation problems? Uh, we passed the uh, highway bills, and uh, it's, it's set. It's, it's, we, Congress argued about it, argued with them about it, uh, and uh, the 270 billion plus bill that is the law for a period of time. And now it's up to you spend the money allocated to you by formula in a wise way. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an issue where the federal government's responsibility is clear in law, and that is that we take the gasoline tax and pass them back to you. But we get to decide where the roads go, and uh, probably what it should be. I'm noticing that, uh, that uh, the inauguration or the campaign for the governor here, part of the, part of the campaign is roads. And that's good. That's the way it should be. People say, vote for me, and there's some about your roads. I hear you're probably the roads, and so you want the decision making about the roads to be here at the lower level. But the federal government's role in highways is pretty well fixed for, for five or six years. Yes, sir. Go ahead, yell at that. Yes, uh, good morning. I'm a CPA here in Allen County. Right. Prepare a couple hundred tax returns here. And uh, the IRS, uh, uh, the IRS does not spend a lot of time auditing. Last administration turned the IRS into a customer service department, and uh, here in the last three years have been reorganized. There's, there's quite a few people that do not comply. I really think the IRS needs to get out there and audit. But none of my clients. Yeah. Substantially uh, over the past housing boom. I guess my question is: Is the consequences of this great housing boom have increased the cost of housing so much not only in this area but throughout the country? It's very difficult for me to envision my kids being able to afford a home or even the workforce that drives much of you know, our school systems and our police and fire forces. How do you see the federal government helping this workforce housing component be able to afford housing close to where their jobs are? Um, markets adjust, and the role of the government is to make sure the market is able to adjust in a way that is not. Uh, precipitous and disruptive. Um, when you have wage and price controls, for example, in history, it's tended to not allow the market to adjust in a smooth function, smooth way. It doesn't function properly, and therefore the consequences of government trying to uh, either manage the price or demand is very severe. So to answer your question, it's one role of the government is to make sure that markets are given the flexibility to adjust in a way that doesn't cause major disruption. If houses get too expensive, people will stop buying them, which will cause people to adjust their spending habits. Uh, secondly, setting of interest rates affects your business. Um, we'd be happy to hear that the White House doesn't set interest rates. The Federal Reserve Board sets interest rates. I get to name the chairman, I named a good guy. But it's their job to be independent from the political process and look at market forces in all aspects of our economy to determine uh, the interest rate to be set. Because they look at inflation, consumer demand, etc. So to answer your question, I think it's, it's I think the simple answer is let the market function properly. Let the market function properly. I, I, I guarantee you that your kind of question has been asked throughout the history of home building. It was, you know, prices for my homes are getting bid up so high that I'm afraid I'm not going to have any consumers for my kids, and yet things cycle. It's just the way it works. 
economy should cycle. We just don't want the cycles to be so severe that it's disruptive so that you, know, you get thrown out of business, for example, or something gets thrown out of work. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming to Loudoun County, Mr. President. Um, I run a nonprofit that provides health care to the uninsured. Good. Something near and dear to your heart. 45 million uninsured people in this country. Of course, Loudoun County is no different. We provide health care free by volunteer physicians who are involved in a nonprofit. And it's a good private public partnership. You talk about community health centers as being part of the health care delivery system. We too are part of the health care delivery system. How do you see the your role and the government's role in helping us do what we do when we've discovered recently that we're not going away any time in the near future? Yeah. Uh, well, first, uh, I think there ought to be a... Well, first, our tax incentives to encourage people to contribute to your non-governmental organization. And the tax code says that you can give to uh, your group or the church, synagogue, or mosque, or somebody whose job it is to help enforce you get abduction for it. So, secondly, um, the uninsured is a... Uh, the uninsured, first of all, there's the working uninsured, a lot of work for small businesses because small businesses can't afford insurance. Small business owners would like to pay for the insurance, but the cost of medicine is increasing. And I just gave you two prescriptions for that. One is uh, a bunch of prescriptions uh, to help control the cost and enable, and, enable, and enable small businesses to be able to manage the expense. If you stand alone as a small business owner, 10,000 businesses, 80% of them which you've got 10 employers or less, and you try to buy insurance as an employer of 10 people, it's going to cost you a lot, heck of a lot more than if you try to buy insurance and with, with your 10 people in a pool of 5,000 people. It's just the way insurance works. It's called spreading the risk. Uh, there are some in the, in the uninsured world who simply choose not to buy insurance. That would be your bulletproof 22-year-old person. Is that in college? I'm never going to be sick. Nothing ever bad going to happen. I just don't think I'm going to want any. <laughs> health savings account is an interesting opportunity for the young 22-year healthy person who's able to put money aside tax-free and watch that money grow tax-free and take the money out of the health savings account tax-free, coupled with a high deductible uh, catastrophic health plan. In other words, this is a product that will say to those who choose, you know, here's an opportunity for you. You start putting aside $1,000 a year, in you buy a high deductible policy with a $1,000 deductible, and you put the $1,000 cash, you do or your employer does, or however you negotiate it, that $1,000 grows. And it can grow to be pretty substantial, particularly as you're a healthy person, over a period of time, tax-free. I mean, it's, it's, and all of a sudden, then you've got a quite, a, quite a nest egg. I'm going to call on Congress, by the way, to make these health savings accounts more attractive, more portable, more individualized. Uh, there are some who come to our country that don't have any health insurance but work. Uh, they're, you know, they, we've got immigrants coming that can't afford health care. Their employers, they, the, the type of job they have is one that doesn't lend itself to health care. That's one way the government can help us to have community health centers as primary care facilities to deliver health care and take the pressure off the emergency rooms. We're expanding these a lot. It's a, in my judgment, it's a good use of taxpayers' money to provide health clinics for the poor and the indigent so that they don't go to where the health care is more expensive, the emergency room, but go to where the health care is uh, primary health is more manageable. So there's a series of ways to address the issue. But the truth of the matter is, government policy has got to aim at the increasing cost of health care. Part of the issue in Medicare is the, pro is the projections of health care costs going up the way they are. The issue that small business owners face in the short term is increasing premiums. So we need medical liability reform to help address the costs. We need to encourage information technologies, and I'm told that there will be a significant reduction in medical costs as we modernize medicine and bring medicine into the 21st century through the use of information technology. 
health savings accounts, uh, encourage consumers to pay attention to price. There needs to be transparency in pricing. Do you realize the med medical field is one where you don't do any comparative shopping? When you buy a tile, I presume, for your house, you're out there shopping. You know, say, look, well, what am I bid? You know, when you buy a pipe, or ask, you know, for things you put in a wall, insulation, you're out there bidding price. There's no transparency in pricing in medicine. You don't know whether the guy next door is going to offer a better deal when it comes to some kind of medical procedure. It seems like to me the more transparency in pricing, the more likely it is consumers will have an input into the cost of health care. So these are ways to address the cost of health care. Obviously, as health care costs, uh, the, the rate of increase is manageable, there'll be less people coming into the city. One of the reasons why the uninsured is going up is the cost is going up. And so the government needs to address the cost. There is a debate in Washington. Some will say the way to address the cost is to have the federal government be the decider. The decider for the consumer and the decider for the provider. And that will be, a, in my judgment, terrible for this country. And so this is a, a we're talking about a very important and interesting debate. And uh, I'm going to continue pushing policies that, that uh, address cost and empower the patient and the doctor into a relationship that is not only good for the patient, but also one which I think will affect the, uh, you know, the pricing mechanisms and the prices here in the country. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. A word of gratitude to you, Mr. President, and your Keep it up, you? yeah. <laughs> About time. <laughs> no, thank you. It's always good to have a plant in every audience, you know? <laughs> well, the timing of this opportunity is uncanny. Uh, I want to thank you for your unwavering support of the Veterans Administration. Um, my father spent the last 10 years at the uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia VA, where he was loved and respected and so well cared for. And uh, we buried him two weeks ago in Arlington, and it struck me then um, how strong the promise still is to our veterans and to our wonderful men and women of the service. Thanks. Uh, you know what I thought just when you said that first? Um, our country's great because we've got a lot of people who have been willing to serve. The really important that we keep an all volunteer military. And one way you do that is to make sure that people pay them well, because you can pay them, that they're trained well, uh, that their loved ones have got adequate housing on the basis, and those family life is, is good. The education system can work on our basis. But also, after service, there is a health care system that will provide a lot of health care for them. It's so nice for bringing that up. The volunteer army is is a um, really an important part of, of, um, of our nation, and it's a really important part of fighting this war on terror. Their kids who know the states, they saw the attack on September 11th. They have made a conscious decision to swear and to serve the country. And um, so thanks for bringing that up. I just, I want to share that with you, to tell you that, that uh, you know, our troops are always on my mind, our families are always on my mind, and it's important to leave a legacy behind of a strong military based upon patriotic Americans saying, I want to serve. I'm stepping up, nobody's telling me to. I have made the decision to do so. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. President. Thank you for being here. My my son is one of those young men. Uh, at 18 years old, I uh, I'm almost I hope I don't cry, but I, I, he asked. I hope me you don't too, because I will as well. Anyway. Okay. He asked me to take him to the Army recruiter. Uh, he didn't drive yet, but he wanted to go to the Army recruiter to join the Army. Uh, he's in the uh, National Guard in Christiansburg, Virginia, 
and uh, he's also with the Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets. Good, thanks, yeah. I know you're proud of him. Yes, I am. He yes. sent his best wishes to you. <laughs> the old commander-in-chief, that's a smart move. <laughs> He and I discussed a question I want to ask you. Most people in this room today are leaders of some type. I'm a leader of an adult education center for Marymount University. And my question to you is, how do you remain upbeat when you're surrounded by the burdens of leadership? That's uh, my faith in my family and my friends, for starters. Um, my, uh, I, I like going home to be with my family. It's uh, I was teasing about Laura waking me up last this morning at 12.45, but I'm glad she did. You know, I take great pride in my little girls. I'm not going to talk about them too much, otherwise these people will look at the newspaper. I'm trying to... <laughs> right, Jackson? <laughs> I'm trying to spare them, because I think that, you know, one of the hardest decisions about going to public life is exposing people you love to, you know, the, the public nature of public life. Um, I, 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 I'm proud to tell you that my friends that, uh, that I knew before I became in public office are still my friends. One of the coolest things to do is not a presidential one of the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> see if you're paying attention. <laughs> the things I like to do is to welcome my, my buddies, uh, and, and Laura feels the same way, people we grew up with. We both grew up in Midland, Texas. I remember having some of my friends that I went to first grade with. A uh, guy broke across the street with Michael Brocker. They came up to have dinner at the White House. You know, they kind of walk in there. You can imagine what it's like. It's a, it's a great honor to be you know, on spot and be They walk in there and kind of, what are you doing here, Bush? You know, <laughs> but I really like it. They're my friends. They help me keep, they help me remind me so if you know that what's important is what you believe. And it's uh, leaders have got to know what know, know the core principle from which you make decisions. And you can't change. A lot of temptation to change and try to make people want to like you. It's not the job of a leader. The job of a leader is to know where he or she wants to lead and know the principles on which you'll make decisions. I take great comfort in having people around me. Uh, who can walk in my office and tell me what's on their mind. It's uh, part of, my job is, I say, what's your job? My job is decision maker. I make a lot of decisions. Obviously some of which you see, and uh, a lot of them you don't. And uh, they're big ones and little ones. But you make a lot of decisions. And, uh, and if you don't, if you're uncertain, about all the facts around the decision, you got to rely upon people. And you then got to create an environment in which people are willing to come in and say, here's what's on my mind. It's important at the president's level, presidential level, it's important in business. You've got to have people comfortable about saying, uh, here's what I think you ought to do, Mr. CEO. You got to listen and have it. I, I've always believed in the flat organizational chart. I think the worst thing that can happen for decision makers is to get a filtered point of view. And it's pretty hard as president, needless to say. But I've got a group of people around me that are empowered to walk in. Uh, you know, Comedy Rice, when she walks in, uh, she comes in as a close friend, but as someone who knows that our friendship will be sustained whether she agrees with me or not. Rumsfeld comes in and he, you know, he's a crusty old guy. He, uh, <laughs> He's got an opinion, and he tells it, and that's important. That's the way it is throughout the White House. I, I like to tell people the first decision I made as president uh, was this. The guy called me. I was at the Blair House looking at my inaugural inaugural speech. I'm trying to get down the board and get ready to go. It's been a pretty big event coming up. I want to make sure that it worked well. He said, uh, "Mr. President, elect." What color rug do you want in the Oval Office? I said, man, this is going to be a decision-making experience. <laughs> what color rug do I want in the Oval Office? He said, no, I'm not kidding you. It turns out presidents design rugs. 
or somebody designs it for him. But I said, I don't know anything about rug designing. So I delegated it to Laura. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the job of a leader is to think strategically. It's important for your businesses. It's important for the country. And so she said, tell me about the rug. And I said, I wanted to say, optimistic person comes here to work every day. This is the strategic thought for the rug. She figured out the colors. He looks like a sun, you know, nice open colors. You walk in that old office, I think you're going to say, just like you know, this guy's optimistic. I'm optimistic. Uh, and by the way, you can't leave your company say, follow me, the world is not going to be good. You're not going to have a lot of employees say, great, I love working here, you know. It's got to be follow me, the world's going to be better, and I have a plan to do it. And one reason I'm optimistic is because I'm sustained by my faith, family, and friends. I'm also sustained by the fact that I believe strongly in the values of the United States of America. Human rights, human dignity, individuals count. Freedom is, freedom is, the, is the future of the world, and I'm sustained by those beliefs. And uh, thanks for the question. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Supervisors, we welcome you. Thanks, tomorrow. thanks for having me. You don't look old enough to have gone. <laughs> I'm the youngest member. Of the yeah, well, is this your board here? This is uh, Mr. Lavadio, Mr. Snow, Mr. Staten, and Mr. Flynn. Yeah, you certainly are the youngest. Pretty young guy, too. And uh, you're happy to know we got health savings accounts from our county employees. Good move. Pushed it through. Good move. But on transportation, one of the solutions that I've been putting forward is telework and expansion of broadband yeah. so that people don't get caught in traffic. The Congress is contemplating a revision to the Telecommunication Act of 96 that would essentially shut down the options that states and localities are exploring to get broadband to every business and every home. Mm. And so what is your thought on, as we are falling behind in the world, on delivering broadband yeah. to businesses and homes and residents? Um, what will you do to... Yeah, I need, I need to find out. Well, I can, it's interesting you said that because I, I laid out the opposite vision, which was that broadband ought to be available and accessible all throughout the country at by a set period of time. I need to make sure I understand what you mean, Congress, is trying to unwind that vision, because it sounds like you and I should. I, I believe you. Thank you for the heads up. I'll take a look. Uh, you're very smart uh, to, uh, uh, to... Part of the role of government is to create an environment in which people are willing to risk capital. Broadband expansion is a part of creating an environment in which it will make it easier for people to be competitive in this part of the world. It's a brilliant idea. The uh, uh, people are able to do so much more from their home, particularly if you've got the technology capable of carrying information. You're right, I want to make sure that you, you, you mentioned that, uh, that other nations are ahead of us. Uh, true, we're catching up and we'll do better, by the way. But it's part of making sure America is competitive to make sure that we've got broadband available and accessible. One of the interesting questions we're going to have is the last mile issue. And uh, a lot of that hopefully will be changed, or at least options, or more options will be available with the development of, of a dish that is capable of uh, passing broadband air over the air as opposed to cable. But um, good question. I, 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 I need to check and see what you're talking about, and we'll. Thanks for bringing it up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, well. Who happens to be one of the best first ladies we have had? Thank you. I thought you might say top two, but you know. <laughs> if not, if not, I, if not, I won't tell. You know? <laughs> When we'll see our lovely first lady run for Senate in the great state of Texas. Never. Come on, ask her. Who no, I'm not asking. She's a. Uh, she's. Never. She's a. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm pretty certain when I married her, she didn't like politics or politicians. And um, 
She did, she's a great lady. She's, uh, she's interested. She's not interested in running for office. She is interested in literacy. Uh, we're going to meet with uh, uh, foundations later on today uh, to encourage them to step in where government can't step in in New Orleans and, and the Gulf Coast. Laura's coming to the meeting, and the reason why is she wants to help uh, these schools get their libraries up. She was a school librarian. She believes strongly in literacy. She is, uh, I can remember her, you know, reading to the girls all the time. And uh, I, I would encourage moms all over the country and dads to sit down and read to your young children over and over and over again. It's one of the lessons she taught me right after she taught me how to read. But uh, <laughs> she's a. Uh, She's right. Thank you for bringing her up. She's not on her office. Yes, sir. Mr. President, uh, my wife Sandy and I extend our prayers and our appreciation for all that you're doing in these uh, uh, difficult issues that you're dealing with. Um, I'm a grandfather, um, about your age, but uh, I have. Uh, um, you got started earlier. I started a little earlier, and, uh, and I'm really proud of my family. Uh, you've touched on a lot of issues that really affect us. We have a Healthcare provider, uh, an attorney uh, uh, in the building industry, in the defense industry, and uh, a young uh, grandson who's espousing to the uh, uh, military academy. We are um, very happy with the foundation that President Reagan and your father laid 23 years ago, about the time the JK started. Uh, we're building off of that today. We're living in that uh, security uh, with a good defense uh, uh, system and we have a strong economy, uh, some of which extends from those days. Do you look forward, and what can I tell my grandchildren, do you look forward 20, 25 years from now and, and see a vision of America? Yeah. Um, I, I, I tell people this story a lot. It, when my dad was 18, he went to fight the Japanese. And uh, some 60 years later, his son sits at the table with the Prime Minister of Japan to help keep the peace. Um, someday, I firmly believe that the leaders in the world and Middle East will be duly elected and will be sitting down with future American presidents to keep the peace. So part of the vision for your children and grandchildren is to understand history and the power of democracy and freedom and liberty to change enemies and the allies. And I, I, I was talked about a lot in my speeches, laying the foundation of peace. And I firmly believe that what we're doing today is laying the foundation of peace. I know, I know, that some say democracy can't take hold in parts of the world. The way sometimes I strongly disagree with that. The natural rights of men and women, that's part of our family, says that inherent in every soul, I believe implanted by a higher being, is the desire to live in freedom, no matter the color of your skin or the religion you embrace. And so part of the vision is to, is to lay that foundation of peace by believing and acting on the principles that cause our own existence to be and on principles and values that have proven over time to yield the peace. Think about Europe. It's hard for some of us to think about Europe because Europe didn't really affect our lives they didn't much. But if you look back over the modern recent history of the United States and the world, two world wars started in Europe. And today Europe is whole, free, and at peace because of democracy, in my judgment. The Far East. <laughs> and the reason this is important is because we're in an ideological struggle. The enemy which attacked us on September the 11th was not, not just acting out of anger, although they were, not acting out of hate, although I believe their hearts are hateful, but they're acting based upon an ideology. 
the best way to make sure the American people understand what happens when their ideology takes hold is to think about life in Afghanistan under the Taliban. If you're a young girl in Afghanistan under the Taliban, you have no chance for success. You have no chance for education. If your mother speaks out in the public square, you get whipped. She can get whipped. These people have a vision that is the opposite of America. Their vision is, here is my view of religion, and if you don't agree with me, you're in trouble. Our belief is, is that what matters is your view of religion. You can choose. The great freedom in America is the ability to choose your religion, to be religious or not religious. You're, we're equally American. Jew, Muslim, Christian, we're all equally American in this country. That's the opposite of what these people think. They have got a uh, strategy. They've got a goal, which is to spread this vision uh, throughout the, uh, the world, starting in the broader Middle East. Like I, I say, it's to go from Spain to Indonesia to establish their vision, a caliphate, but they're, they're, they're going to do it. These are ideologues. And so you defeat an ideology with a better ideology. If there's, if there's no competition, if there's a vacuum, if there's poverty, hunger, and, and, hunger and anxiety, and, and, and a vacuum's created because that, this, this ideology will move in. However, there's a competing ideology available. If there's an alternative for people to choose from, then all of a sudden their march to their vision is impeded in the long run. Democracy is the alternative. Liberty its not American-style democracy. Japan didn't say, let's just look like America. Japan said, we'll have a democracy that suits our needs. That's the way democracies uh, develop. They develop with history and culture of the people in mind. Uh, and so what you're seeing in Iraq is twofold. One, a commitment to defeat an enemy overseas so they don't hit us again, coupled with uh, Allowing these Iraqis to live a dream of being free. And it's tough work. It's tough because some of the enemy are these ideologues that are trying to stop the march of freedom. Some of them are people that are irritated because Saddam's not in power. They liked it being the, you know, the power of the Some of them are wondering whether or not the Sunni rejectionists are wondering whether or not they'll even have a say in the future government and therefore are nervous given the dynamics of the demographics. But some of our people there intent upon destroying the advance of democracy because they understand, they know, that they can't compete with, with liberty. And the amazing thing that happened last year that I hope this gives me hope is that uh, millions of Iraqis made a choice. You know, they defied terrorists. We see it. The terrorists that have weapons of our TV screens. These people are cold-blooded killers, I'm telling you. I mean, as you know, I need to tell you that. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to drive us out before democracy can take hold. Because they understand, I haven't talked to them, so I'm not exactly sure. I'm not putting words in something like I would suspect they'll leave in their soul they understand they can't compete. Their ideology cannot compete with liberty. And so to answer your question, far plus a long answer, but it's, a, it's an important question. The president's got me thinking down the road. We've got a short-term battle we're going to win. But there's a long-term struggle as well. It's an ideological struggle. At home, uh, I think the two things that uh, I would like to be remembered for, and one is promoting ownership. I want people to own something. I want people owning their own small business. I want people owning their own homes. I think people ought to be allowed to own their own health care account and make decisions for what's best for them in their own cities. I know a vibrant social security system is one in which people are able to take some of their own money if they so choose and put it in a personal savings account so they get a better rate of return on their own money than the government can get to the social security trust. But more importantly, But more importantly, I want people owning something. I'll never forget going to a Mississippi automobile manufacturing plant. And I was on a lot of floor workers there, you know. And I said, uh, how many of you own your own 401ks? This is needless to say, it was a very diverse audience. So 95% of the hands went up. Men, women, black, white. And I said, how does it feel to own your own assets? See, one of the problems we've had that showed that we found out on us is not we want a lot of we take some things we take for granted, like the generations passing assets from one generation to the next. 
just didn't happen in the African American community. It should. We ought to encourage. We take it for granted, don't we? Some of us do. You know, you pass the house on. All these people didn't own their own homes. A lot of them didn't have checking accounts. And yet, one of the things we ought to encourage is systems, uh, is reforms that enable somebody to own something so they can pass it on to their child. That's part of creating stability, healthy families, and strength. So I want to be known as an owner's trick. And I also want to be known as the person that kept the Tocqueville vision for America alive. Tocqueville was a freshman. He came to America in the 1830s. And he studied America. And he came away uh, impressed by our democracy, but really impressed by the fact that people came together to serve a greater cause through voluntary organizations. People said, you know, how best to help in a vibrant society, help a neighbor, and that is they formed what he, what he called voluntary organizations to help a neighbor in need. The great strength of this country is the fact that there are millions of loving souls in America who are willing to reach out to somebody in need. I always say government can't love. No, it's just not a loving organization. There are people who work for government who have love in their heart for government itself. It's not love. It ought to be law and justice. The judgment of government ought to be constantly thinking about ways to rally what I call the armies of compassion so that light can head into the dark corners of our country, so that people who have heard the call to love a neighbor are empowered to do so and encouraged to do so. One of the most, I think, one of the most important and interesting domestic initiatives was that the greatest great and interesting philosophical debate is to allow faith-based programs uh, and community-based programs to access federal money in order to achieve the results we all want. I mean, for example, if you're uh, trying to encourage people to quit drinking, then it makes sense to give somebody an alternative. You can make a government to say, you know, counselor. Or how about somebody who calls upon a higher being to help you quit drinking? All I care about is the results. And the government ought to be uh... So the answer, that's a long answer. And by the way, it's my last answer, because you, you're paying me a lot of money. I'm probably I'm not going to argue about my salary. But i got to get back to work. I do want to thank you for your interest. I hope you can tell I understand the importance of making sure America is entrepreneurial heaven. You know, one of the things that I love when I travel the world is that you can get a sense for you know, country by asking questions. One of the things about our country is uh, it's a place where you start with zero. You start with a dream and a good idea, in this case a good mom and dad, and take risk and realize your dream and it's really important we keep it that way forever. America has got to be a place where dreamers can realize their dreams. And I love being in the midst of dreamers. Thanks for letting me come by. God bless you all.